welcome to our study through the Gospel according to Mark. We've been seeing Jesus uh, get questioned by the religious leaders, give his own questions to them, and now we come to this passage which some commentators actually think is one of the most difficult to understand in the whole New Testament. So I'm going to tell you exactly what it means. No, that's definitely not the case. But I am going to give us some ways to think about this passage, hopefully um, some categories to make sense of it, because it's, it's biblical prophecy. It's talking about what's going to come in the future. And these are the passages in Scripture that, that often lead us to struggle the most, because they're, they're unclear. At least it seems that way from our perspective. But we'll talk about that as we go. So in Mark chapter 13, it says that as Jesus was going out of the temple courts, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, Look at these tremendous stones and buildings. Like, wow, isn't this amazing? Look at the splendor that exists here. And Jesus says to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. All will be torn down. Now, that's, that's kind of a, a, a change of pace, right? A hard right turn in the conversation. Look at this really beautiful thing. And then the person replies, Yeah, it's all going to be torn down. But, but why is Jesus saying that? Well, I think there are several reasons. But let's talk about the temple itself. The temple in Jerusalem covered an area about one-sixth the size of the whole city of Jerusalem at the time, a building a sixth of a city. That's a remarkable thing, and it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was, it was a miraculous, spectacular place to behold. But Jesus says it's all going to come down, and this will be the accusation at Jesus' trial if we look forward in the Gospel of Mark, where the Pharisees are going to say that Jesus said he would destroy the temple in three days, and that he would rebuild it. And this just seemed fantastical to them. They couldn't believe it. And it was additionally insulting and an affront. Like, whoever's going to destroy the temple, that's not a good thing, they thought. Now, this was partially applied to the Old Covenant. So when Jesus talks about the temple going away and being destroyed, and him rebuilding it in three days, there is this allusion to himself that the Old Covenant is represented by the temple. It's where people come to offer animal sacrifices. And that was going away as a part of the Old Covenant. And Jesus would rebuild the temple himself from a certain perspective, right? He's in the ground three days, and then he rises. So there is that dynamic here, but I think much more is being spoken of in this passage where there are multiple layers of prophecy that Jesus is talking about. So Jesus is saying the temple is going to be destroyed, and it actually was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. The Romans come and, and in some ways, proverbially leave no stone on another. They tear it down to where there's even discrepancies and disagreements to today as to where exactly the temple stood. Exactly. That's, that's how bad of a job they did destroying it. It was leveled to the ground. And in verse 14, there's this this phrase that's really difficult to understand, but there's this interesting tie-in with what happens in church history also. And it says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, we'll talk about this abomination of desolation in a minute, but how the early church understood this was to refer to Rome. And so when they see Rome coming in to occupy Jerusalem and the temple, people actually fled. They fled to the mountains, and many of them were saved. We actually have this recorded uh, from different Christians at the time, that church history reflects that people understood this as a prophecy that benefited them some 20, 30 years after Mark is writing this. People actually fled and were saved. Now, what's this abomination of desolation? Well, whole books have been written about this, and and we're not going to solve it today. But it is, at the very least, an allusion to Daniel uh, 9.27. And this was partially fulfilled uh, several hundred years before Jesus is saying this, but it was a partial fulfillment because in the year 167 BC, Antiochus IV sent forces to suppress an Israelite rebellion in Jerusalem. And they entered the temple, they set up idols, and they sacrificed pigs in the temple, right? The animal that was considered unclean by God, they actually sacrificed in the temple. And hence it was called and thought of as an abomination because it actually was an abomination in God's eyes. So this was a partial fulfillment. But Jesus is speaking after this. He's saying, you thought that was partially it, and it was, but there's more to come of this fulfillment of what will be an abomination of desolation, something that will be abominable to God. Now, what exactly is it? Like I said, there's so many perspectives on this, but this should force us to ask about the nature of biblical prophecy. And one illustration that's been helpful to me is thinking of prophecy like a mountain range. 
One of my favorite places to go is Colorado and just sit on the side of one mountain and look at a bunch of other mountains. And what's interesting is, is when you look at a mountain range, they all look like they're right next to each other and one's right behind the other. And this one is, you know, to the left or right of that one. But when you actually start looking at them on a map or you try and go hike them, you realize that the ones that looked right next to each other may have been 10, 20, 30, 50 miles apart that from our perspective, everything looks kind of close in a mountain range. And often it's much more spread out and we don't have a good sense for those distances. Biblical prophecy is very much like looking at a mountain range. The things that in the text might seem like they're right next to each other in time could be hundreds or thousands of years apart. And this is somewhat related to how Jesus could say that the generation that's hearing him would not pass away until the first of the signs were fulfilled. Because that generation, at least many of them, does live to 70 AD to see a first partial fulfillment when the temple is destroyed. So we're not going to get too into the the specifics, but there are definitely some noteworthy themes in this passage that would be good for us to think on. Jesus describes the signs of the times. Now, if you read these signs that he's talking about, it might seem like he's talking about today. And there is a sense in which since Jesus ascended into heaven until he comes back is the end times. There is a sense in which we are living in the end times. We are waiting for Jesus to come back. And that takes us to another theme in this passage. It calls Christians living in that time between the ascension and the return of Jesus to live faithfully, to persevere. And perseverance assumes that there's going to be difficulty and tribulation. And so we need to kind of gird our loins, to use a biblical phrase that sounds kind of archaic, but to prepare ourselves to live faithfully in this circumstance. And this passage also contains several things we are told to do, imperatives, things that we should go and make sure we do. And what's interesting is this passage isn't primarily about satisfying our curiosity of the end times, of what's going to come. The Bible actually doesn't seem too concerned with with answering the curiosities that, that humankind just often has. But it does tell us how to live in the uncertainty of what's coming. It does tell us how to be faithful, how to persevere. And it gives us practical teaching to live in the time between Jesus' departure and his return. Now, there are several views on the end times, but there are some things we should all agree on. We should agree that Jesus is coming back. He's not surprised by the events that are taking place. And by the Spirit and the Word, He helps us to persevere. And perhaps most importantly, we should anticipate His return with expectation and hope. 